practically speaking, many believers uh, do not consider the Scripture to be the final authority, even if they would sign a doctrinal statement saying so. Oftentimes, individuals will say, well, the Bible may say that, but... And if that's you, the Scripture is not your authority. Or the Bible, I know that that's what the Bible says, but you have to consider. You heard that? Doesn't it just absolutely kill you if you understand where I'm coming from? When people say to you things like, you have to understand the culture of the day. As though an eternal book is limited to a decade or so. Isn't that, isn't that a funny statement? Brother Matt's laughing. Are you laughing about that or something, something else, huh? Still laughing over your Chick-fil-A joke? That <laughs> <laughs> is pretty funny. <laughs> I, I agree with you. Yeah. It's really comical, isn't it? Because people say, well, you have to understand the culture of the day. Well, my friend, God has always superseded culture. I used to say this a lot, but I have not so much so recently. But I will this evening, hopefully for your edification. And that is that as believers, we are supposed to come up with a concept of biblical culture. In other words, culture is really a nice name for the world, honestly. In other words, when we talk about the culture, the Bible doesn't talk about the culture. It actually does it? A little bit. It, 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 it doesn't use the word culture, but it talks about cultures. Study Titus sometime. I, every time I think of Titus, it cracks me up thinking of what Paul said. When he told Timothy to ordain elders in every city, he left him behind to ordain elders in every city. And then he said, uh, you know, you're supposed, to, you're supposed to set up pastors and train them from all these cities. And then he said, he says the Cretans have a saying about themselves. Remember this? The Cretans are all liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And then he said, this witness is true. In other words, he said they have a saying about themselves. And he said it's actually pretty true. He's talking about their culture. And he said that Timothy was supposed to ordain elders out of that culture. Did he, did he mean, well, you know something? Obviously, if they're all liars, evil beasts, slow bellies, you're going to have some pretty rough pastors. Or did he mean that God saves and changes people when they become uh, biblically centered in their culture? They'll be different. I mean, I think Titus has some qualifications, doesn't it, for what a pastor ought to be like? Yeah, in spite of the culture. And so, Christian, it'll help us, it will help us a great deal if we will consider that we're to be like Jesus Christ and that God is well aware of the circumstances within which you were born because He had quite a lot to do with forming you in your mother's belly and the time frame in which He did so. You're not an accident. You didn't happen accidentally. It isn't by mistake that you were born when you were born, where you were born, in the culture, quote, that you're born in. God knows all of that, and He also knows that you can reflect His holy character and nature with Jesus Christ. And so, the Bible is our authority. That's what we go to. We say, well, it doesn't really make any difference, actually, what people do. Well, Pastor, you have to understand, you know, this past week, I spent a lot of time listening to people explain to me why something that the Bible forbade was acceptable because I was in a minority as far as pastors that didn't think it was okay because of what the Bible says. Well, you know, this pastor, he, you know, he took your position, but when this happened, you know, he realized, you know, you really can't take that position just because the Bible says it. No, you can actually just do what the Bible says. And so I hope the Bible's your authority. God give us a church. God give us churches. Doesn't mean there's always going to be apostasy. But God help us not to have to go to a church where we just teach what we want the Bible to say instead of being under the authority of the Scripture. Man, authority is a good thing. We need it. Stop that. I'll turn you off. I can't handle that. I'm sorry. Hopefully one speaker will be good enough. That drives me crazy. Jonah chapter 3. You there now? In your authority? God saw their works that they turn. You going to do it too? <laughs> 
Verse 10, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that He said that He would do unto them. And He did it not. Chapter 4, verse 1, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. Father, please help us as we look at this good example of a bad example to understand who you are and what you're capable of in spite of us. And then God help us as well to be able to look at examples and God for us to be right in our hearts. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this is the series that never ends. That's the way I feel about this good examples of bad examples. I wanted to do three or four weeks and we're quite a bit beyond. That was a chord. We're quite a bit beyond uh, the three or four weeks that it that I initially planned on. But what keeps happening is I keep thinking, well, I can't leave this one out. And, you know, somebody, several people said, Pastor, when are you going to preach about Job and Job's friends? I, you know, I don't want, okay, I'm going to preach about Job and Job's friends. You gotta, can't leave them out of good examples of bad examples. I think the classic, the Benedict Arnold, if you will, of the good examples of bad examples is Balaam. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, the Bible just uses him over and over and over again as a good example of a bad example. So Balaam's like the classic guy. But another one that I just couldn't leave out is our friend Jonah. And I hope that you know the story of Jonah more so uh, from the... You know, we, I've got to be careful. I'm always insulting Sunday school teachers. And Sunday school teachers are so vital. They're so important to our ministries. They get picked on all the time, don't they? You know, if listen, if you Sunday school teachers had never played with cotton puffs, you wouldn't be having the problems that you're having. You know, when you glued those cotton puffs onto the sheep drawings, it got it all started. And that's where the doctrine in the Sunday school class went sour, I think. It's when they started, you know, doing the crafts. You Sunday school teachers need to get your crafts out so your kids can learn the Bible. Okay. <laughs> but don't you and I usually have like our, if we grew up in the church, don't we have our Sunday school teacher version of most stories? And I mean, Jonah, the story of Jonah, you know, it's, 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 it ought to be preached a lot, but it's actually like a story a lot of times, isn't it? You know, in the story, actually, when the kids leave Sunday school class, is that a fish swallowed Jonah or a whale swallowed Jonah? The Bible uses both. I think it was a whale. Like I think that God knows enough if he qualified it by saying a whale. You say, Pastor, a whale is technically not a fish. Listen, God made whales and God made fish and he can call them whatever he wants to. And I don't have any problem. I'm not even being silly about that. That's a good enough answer for me. So in the Bible when it talks about Jonah being swallowed by a whale or it says a great fish, you if you want to technically say a a, a a whale isn't a fish. More power to you. You take it up with the Creator and you won't get anywhere. You see my point? So uh, it was a great fish, which was a whale. Is what, I mean, that's what the Bible says, isn't it? Okay, so you, you hear the story of Jonah and the whale and you come away with this question of is it possible to live in a whale for three days? And that's like the debate, right? Don't the evolutionists like own the story of Jonah anymore? I mean, it's like, how the hell is it humanly possible to live inside of a whale? Can I tell you that there's nothing about what happened with Jonah and the great fish, or the storm, or Nineveh, that was humanly possible? God prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Listen, if you don't believe a guy could survive in a whale's belly, then you don't also believe that God could, pre could prepare a great fish. Do you? I mean, which one's more difficult than the other? Okay, so let me help you with the science of it, okay? Let's have some fun, if you don't mind. It's Sunday night, and we're, we got an extra hour tonight. We're doing fantastic. <laughs> so, uh, okay, here's what happened. God prepared a great fish. When did He start preparing the fish? About two minutes before? Let me find a fish, quick. Before the universe began. Yeah, before the universe began, God prepared the fish to swallow the whale. Okay, that's good due diligence, okay? So when God prepared the fish, he created it with a gas problem. <laughs> yeah. It's not in the Bible, but God prepared the fish. You want to know how Jonah could breathe inside the fish. It had a gas problem. God prepared it, and he programmed that in. 
Now you can take that and write your science textbook. <laughs> okay, I'm being a little bit silly, but friends, honestly, if God could prepare a fish as a problem for God to make Jonah able to breathe inside the fish for three days now. But actually, that has not, that's not the point of the entire story. When we hear the story of Jonah, we think about Jonah and the whale, and Jonah and the Ninevites, but that's not the point of the story at all. The fact of the matter is that Jonah wasn't surprised about the fish. And Jonah wasn't surprised about the storm. I mean, Jonah wasn't like, oh, now God, I know that you're the God of heaven and earth because you can prepare a storm. Or God, you can prepare a fish. And now I know. No, Jonah knew all that about God already and it didn't even phase him, actually. It didn't even affect him. He's in the boat and he's sleeping and he's trying to die. God said, go down to Nineveh. And he said, okay. So he got a ticket for, was it Joppa? Headed to Joppa, the opposite direction. And uh, on, or on Tarsus, I'm sorry. Yeah, and went down to... So he fled, fled out of Tarsus and then went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarsus. So he's going the opposite direction. He's in a ship on the way to Tarsus. What is Jonah's fondest hope in going to Tarsus? What? Yet 40 days, none of us shall be destroyed. That's the message, right? What's Jonah hoping will happen on the way to Tarshish? He's hoping Nineveh will be destroyed. And, and what is his hope for himself? Huh? He's on a suicide mission. He's hoping God will kill him. That's what he's hoping. Pastor, I don't think so. Okay, let's, let's just, just bear with me for about 30 seconds, okay? When they found that it was Jonah that was the cause of the storm, what did Jonah say to do? Because he was a really great swimmer, right? I mean, it was such a storm that a boat couldn't survive, so I mean, I'm just going to swim it out. Right? Why do you want him to throw him overboard? He wanted to drown. He wanted God to kill him. He said, God, kill me. God, you're going to have to kill me. I'm not going to Nineveh. You're going to have to kill me. See, Jonah wasn't doubtful about the message. He didn't wonder, I wonder if God's really telling me to go to Nineveh. That wasn't the doubt. Jonah said, I want the Ninevites to be destroyed. And I'm not going. And God, you can kill me, but I'm not going. And so he went the opposite way, and he expected God to destroy the Ninevites and kill him, and he figured, hey, fair's fair. You know, I die, they die, we're all dead, and I'll die happy. He was in rebellion. It was a suicide journey that Jonah was taking. Okay, so God prepared a great fish. <laughs> this isn't a message about suicide this evening. God might let you kill yourself. And God might allow it, but oftentimes He doesn't. Matter of fact, I've seen it happen a lot of times that God doesn't allow it. And I'll tell you something, the journey of trying to rebel against God instead of being what God wants instead of God letting God do what He wants in your life, my friend, the misery that you'll go through and what God has to bring you through to get your heart right is way more than it's worth, so why not just get right? You say, Pastor, you don't know what I'm going through? Listen, you have no clue how much Jonah loved his people, his nation. He was a prophet. He was a legitimate prophet of God for the nation of Israel. And I would just be just as straightforward as I can in saying Jonah dearly loved the people that God had called him to prophesy to. And that was the source of his angst. Sometime read the Scripture about the, about the Ninevites. Sometime read history about the Ninevites and you'll see why Jonah wanted them dead. If he loved his people, he hated them. They'd done terrible, atrocious, indescribable things. Things we wouldn't describe. Wouldn't talk about the things the Ninevites did to God's people. Terrible. And Jonah said they ought to die. And he was willing to sacrifice his own life to that cause because he had a real problem with God. And his problem with God was what he said in the end, that he knew God was merciful. Okay, so... When we do good examples of bad examples, it's always fair, of course, we want to make sure that we point out God, right? We want to look at God's character. When we do good examples of bad examples, also it's always fair to point out the good in the people that, uh, that we're representing. In other words, 
If I'm going to be a bad example of something, I'd like for people to at least mention, you know, well, he was good to his mother or something along the lines of, you know, you guys ever read the book, but he was good to his mother about the Jew a Jewish mafia guy or whatever. Anyway, uh, you know, I always thought that was a great line, but he was good to his mother. You know, he's like, you know, at least tell, tell about the good things about the guy. Maybe like just evil all the way through, but at least there's a redeeming quality. And we owe it to Jonah, don't we, in all fairness? So let's talk about the good in Jonah. In a day and age in which God was actually using the Assyrians, Assyrians to judge His people, Jonah was actually a faithful prophet. In a day and age in which His people and His nation were rife with idolatry, Jonah worshipped the true and living God. And that set him apart in stark contrast with anyone else. We mentioned a little bit ago, but it is worth emphasizing that Jonah loved God's people. He loved his nation. I'll just be honest with you. It's tough to like somebody who doesn't have a gratitude for the nation within which they were born and a certain sense of national pride. There's something wrong with your outlook on life if you don't have a degree of love for your people and the nation that God allowed you to be born in. I'm not saying you, you overlook faults, that you blindly uh, buy into whatever agenda or things that are even against God. I'm just saying God made you a part of a nation of people and you ought to just be so overcome with gratitude at the life that God has given you that you ought to be thankful for the nation He put you in. I am extremely proud to be an American. And if I were a Russian, I'd probably be just as proud. In other words, I'm, I'm a real patriot. I love this country. That's, that's a fact. People who really know me know that. But I'll tell you, if I were a Russian, I'd probably be a Russian patriot. I'd still know America was the best country in the world, but I'd be a Russian. You know, I mean, like, how can you not love the people, that, the place where God had you to be born? How can, What's wrong with a person? And the grat ingratitude just grates me. Entitlement and ingratitude are the, are the worst attitudes in any person to deal with. When a person feels like the life they have isn't as good as they deserve, they're entitled and they're ungrateful and they're not nice people. And it's hard to like them. And so... I'm going to give Jonah props. He loved his nation. He was a true worshiper of God. He had an intimate relationship with God. He's a patriot. And I think that's a good thing. The only thing bad about Jonah was that he didn't like God's mercy. He didn't like that God was long-suffering and merciful in an indiscriminatory fashion. In other words, he wanted God to be a, be a respecter of persons. He wanted God to love Israel and hate everybody else. Or he wanted God to love the idolatry of this group of people and hate the idolatry of this group of people. He wanted God to be a respecter of persons. That was his beef. God saw their works, verse 10, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them, and He did it not. He didn't do it. And, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry, and here's what he prayed. He prayed to the Lord said, I pray to thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. God, I knew you were like this. I knew it. Gracious, merciful, long-suffering. And you don't even want to judge the wicked. And it's funny because what he says, if you were to write on the wall, you know, 
The character of God, gracious, long-suffering, merciful, kind. It'd be a positive thing, but Jonah is, is saying this with as much vehemence, as much angst, and as much frustration as he can voice. He's sobbing. He's in tears. He's, you ever seen somebody, somebody so angry they're crying? Always cracks me up when a man cries for not good reason. I, when a guy cries, it's okay if it's for something worth crying over. Can't think what that would be, but <laughs> I know that's true. Okay, I, I, I know that there are things I would think of. Okay, but you ever seen a guy so mad he's just sobbing? I've seen guys just. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're just crying. They're just so angry. They're just so frustrated. And this is Jonah. He's just bawling his eyes out and he's blubber and he's mad because God didn't destroy Nineveh. And you and I would think that if you were to just remove the statement before and after what Jonah said, you'd think what a marvelous praise song Jonah just wrote about God. Wouldn't you? God, I knew. I knew. And you just think, man, you know, Jonah knew this about God. How many people know that about God, actually? How many people actually know how gracious God is? Actually. All the time, men rail and accuse God of not being gracious. All the time, people say to God, God, you are you're an angry God. You're ready to judge. He said, slow to anger. Merciful. Of great kindness. God, you're just not fair. You don't love. You're not kind. And Jonah said, God, I've always known this about you. And yet he's angry. He said, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. He said, God, you're so good, I want to die. I can't stand it. And he wasn't joking. I'm serious. I want to make some application here. We're almost done. It is very possible for you and I to have a very correct understanding of the character of God. Who God is, what God believes, what God thinks, and how God responds. And at the same time for you and I to somehow not respond in kind to who God is. Let me ask you a question. Why do we love God? He first loved us. Do you understand what response in kind is? I get frustrated all the time with parents who are disrespectful to their children and expect respect. They demand respect. They disrespect their kids and then demand their kids respect them. That frustrates me watching parents do that. Adults the same way. They want respect from, from youth. They want respect from someone they don't give it. How do you get respect? Huh? You be respectful, right? I'll just be honest with you. I don't really get disrespected very much. I think I must be a very respectful person. I try to be, actually. The reality of it is, is that, you know, it's kind of unfair to demand respect when you're not respectful. How does a person receive grace? Being gracious. How does a person receive... You, you remember what Jesus said? Remember the man who was owed a debt, and he said, pay me that thou owest. After he'd been forgiven the debt, what did God say? <laughs> Okay, you, I forgave your debt. You didn't forgive him. And so now I'm going to throw you into prison. Graciousness begets graciousness. Mercy begets mercy. Kindness begets kindness. So often we expect, even God, to demonstrate behavior toward us that we don't reciprocate. And I think Jonah is an unusual example. Will you not agree? Because he intimately knew graciousness, kindness, mercy. He knew all these attributes that described God. And he didn't have a single one of them himself. It's a 
tragedy, isn't it, when a Christian gets their act together, receives God's mercy, but then they don't seem to have any kind of mercy for someone else who is where they once were? It's laughable sometimes to me how unmerciful people can be about other individuals who are in the very place they once were. Have you seen it? How can they... How could anyone, and I'm just thinking, you know, not so long ago, you. It's funny when kids do it, as long as they only do it once, isn't it? It's funny when a kid can't believe how terrible his sibling is. And yet he himself was the example for the behavior that was emulated oftentimes. That's funny. But friend, it's not very funny in the church house, is it? It's not a very good example. And Jonah knew God well enough that he knew that God wouldn't destroy Nineveh if they repented. And he knew something about God where... I mean, what's the likelihood of this great revival in Nineveh? How many of you would like to preach a message and have it received? Like, what's the likelihood of this? Well, in this case study, 100%. That's the only, that's the only um, you know, we don't have like, you know, this city and this city. It's just Nineveh is the only example that we have, but 100%. And you know, sometimes Christians think they'll never repent. God will never. No, Jonah actually had that part down. Jonah said, you know what, if I go to them with that message, they're going to repent. And if they repent, God's going to forgive them and they're not going to get judged like they deserve can't preach that message. God made him preach the message and God did what God does. And then said the Lord unto Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry? And Jonah, you right about this? Is this the correct attitude? He didn't answer. Uh, Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, or uh, east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under the shadow until he might see what would become of the city. I mean, God hasn't even been merciful yet. And he just knows God's going to do this. But he's hoping God will just nuke him. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and make it, made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. <laughs> are you crazy when you're by yourself? Yes. Are, are you a talker? You talk to yourself? Do you, do you ever look over in the car and people are watching you talk to yourself? Are you one of those people? <laughs> okay, a bunch of you guys. You all crazy. I know you do this. Okay, so you're... You're Jonah. You're waiting for the city to be destroyed. Forty days, that's a long time to wait. Yeah, Forty days, it shall be destroyed. I'm going to wait and watch. What is that? Hey, buddy. Where's that little thing? How are you growing out here? That's something else. You probably spit on the gourd to water it, you know, trying to encourage it to grow. The thing grew up fast. Grew over his head and provided him shade. He's probably petting it. I mean, this is his buddy. Like his little plant. Y'all you know, ever talk? Y'all talk to plants? No, yeah. If you ever, if you ever tried to raise a plant, you'd talk to it. If you're really trying to nurture one, plants respond to talk. They respond to music. You know, it's good for a plant to talk to it. Okay. If you don't, if you don't know that, try raising a plant without talking to it, and then try raising a plant and talking to it, and you'll see what I mean. So he's become buddies with this plant. He's. You know, it's been time-lapse growth with Jonah watching it. You ever go away and you're like, wow, that thing really grew? Not Jonah. He watched it grow and watched the city. And they've become friends. I mean, they've spent time together. This has become a familiar thing. And Jonah just starting to love this gourd. <laughs> I don't know what the name of it is. I'm surprised he didn't name it, to be honest with you. I am surprised he didn't, you know, come up with something. Never mind, I won't tell you what I'd name it. I'm surprised he didn't name it and have a you know have term of affection for it. And here he is enjoying life, you know. Hey, Gord, me and you, we're gonna watch the Ninevites burn. This is gonna be fun, you know. Front row seat. Thanks for being here. Glad you could uh, be here and enjoy my show. And then the Bible says God killed the Gord. <laughs> he fell in love with the Gord and God killed him. <laughs> and son. Did arise, verse 8, 
or verse eight. The morning, then the morning rose. The next day, it smote the gourd that it withered. A worm just cut it off right at the nub. It's boom, dead. You you can't put you can't put it back together. Worm killed it. And then, <laughs> when God in verse eight, <coughs> when the sun did arise, God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted. And wisdom himself to die and said, It's better for me to die than to live. Jonah, that's your theme song. <laughs> Nothing new there. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Now go back. Go back to verse 4. Jonah saw the repentance of Nineveh. He didn't see God spare Nineveh, but he saw the repentance of Nineveh, and it made him angry. And God said, Doest thou well to be angry? And he didn't respond. God prepared a gourd. Jonah became friends with the gourd. God had a worm cut off the gourd, and a wind and sun dried, the, or a wind uh, blew on Jonah and beat on his head, and he got sunburned, and he got mad, and he said, I'd rather, It's better for me to die than to live. And God said, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? I mean, cats are one thing, but a gourd. You know, I could probably be more upset over a gourd than a cat. And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Now, this is a little bit of faulted perspective, I'd say, wouldn't you? I don't care. I'm not concerned if six score thousand persons that can't discern between their right hand and left die, but I don't want to see a gourd killed. I mean, this guy should have been on whale wars. Right? Abort babies, save whales. Something like that. You talk about a man who knew God, who knew what God thought, and that God was gracious and merciful and full of loving kindness and not willing to destroy the wicked. The kind of a God that when you said, yet forty days, none of us shall be destroyed, and they repented. The kind of God that wouldn't destroy Nineveh. And the man literally wants to die over a gourd. You know what his problem is? He didn't reflect the character of God. God cares about what? Souls. God cares about people. God cares about souls. You couldn't say Jonah didn't care about people, but he only cared about certain people. Now let's get real. Churches, many churches exist around the type of people they care about. Isn't it so? We care about down and outers, which sometimes means we don't care about up and outers. We care about up and outers, which means we don't care about down and outers. We care about kids. We care about adults. We care about, you know what, my friend, you know who God cares about? He cares about everybody. And while Jonah is extremely unreasonable, in the middle of what he says, there's actually a lot of relatable sin when it comes down to it. The truth of the matter is that you wouldn't like a Ninevite coming in your church after you knew the stuff they did. You'd be like people today who say that a murderer can't be saved. popular today among some people that think they're preaching on behalf of God to say that certain people can't be saved because of how wicked they are. But God spared all of Nineveh and I promise you it's illegal to be as wicked as they were. It wouldn't be tolerated in any civilized world. You can't believe God would save people in America that have committed crimes. But the things the Ninevites did are beyond description. Okay, I will not describe those things. And God spared them and it made Jonah angry. 
Because Jonah was angry at the kind of people God saves, which is all kinds of people. You and I have to be careful not to reflect the same kind of sentiment toward men and toward God's response of mercy to sinful men. As difficult as that seems. And so we actually need Jonah's example. Because it's a good example of a bad example that we don't want to emulate. But we actually, we actually could. Father, thank You for what You've taught us this evening. Help us to absorb it, to comprehend it, and Lord, by the help of Your Spirit, to identify it when it comes up in our lives. And Lord, to be gracious because You're gracious. Thank You in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.